Pan, uh, rejoin us. Uh, he's been with us before and led us in great conversation about issues related to the AAPI community and especially increases in violence towards that community in the uh, age of the pandemic in particular. Uh, so Norbert has joined us and he'll be in conversation with our very own Anna Kwong, uh, the chair of the undergraduate studies program at uh, Antioch University, Santa Barbara. A uh, quick uh, announcement or two, next week, uh, Janica Bowman Lewis will be joining us. She's got a new book that just came out in April and she'll be in conversation with LaCoya and I believe some other folks uh, around that book. Sorry, I don't have their names, um, but she's always interesting. She's been with us several times. And so we encourage you to, to turn out. It's looking at um, the experience of African-American girls uh, her new book. So um, that should be terrific. And we're, we've made uh, arrangements to um, uh, have that book available for you through Malik's bookstore, our partner here in Los Angeles uh, with Messy Conversations. And then our final Messy Conversation for the summer, uh, July 31st, uh, it'll be our third anniversary. Uh, with Messy Conversations. So we're trying to plan something a little special for that. And we encourage you to turn out for that. It'll be a two for one Messy Conversation. So bring a friend, they get in free. Um, it'll be great. And with that, I'm gonna get out of the way and hand things over to my partner, Anna Kwong. Thank you, David. And hello, uh, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're Zooming from. I'm Anna Kwong. Um, today, we have the pleasure to introduce my friend and former colleague, uh, Norbert Ten, to you today. Um, as some of you know, Norbert served as the Antioch's Associate Vice Chancellor for Institutional Advancement six years ago, which is when I got a chance to start working with him. Um, Norbert currently serves as the Deputy Director of AAPI Equity Alliance. And this is one of the co-founding partners of Stop AAPI Hate, a coalition which Norbert will be speaking about today. Uh, Norbert earned his MBA in nonprofit management from UCLA and his bachelor in business administration from UC Berkeley. Uh, he's currently a certified executive coach and consults with nonprofit uh, in the region. He lives with his family in Thousand Oaks. Uh, so he's between our LA and Santa Barbara campus. So um, Norbert, uh, we have about half an hour or 30 minutes to, to talk about. Uh, would you uh, put us up to speed and update about with last three years since Stop API was founded? And would you remind us why it was founded? Yeah, sure, Anna, thank you so much. And it's good to see some familiar faces here. I saw uh, Dr. Ben Pryor from Seattle and Stephanie and Ryan. When I met Ryan, I think in Santa Barbara, you didn't have facial hair. So six years later, Ryan has a, a better title and more facial hair. We appreciate that. Um, and, and Mark, good to see Mark Howard. Yeah. Um, so it's it's been uh, quite a journey the past three years, and happy to also speak to maybe some of the uh, uh, if there's students on here in terms of my path to where I've ended up in in racial and social justice because my background been mostly in uh, higher education and arts nonprofit management. Um, but you know, just for some of you that weren't on, we had a messy conversation. I want to say two two and a half years ago. And uh, and it's been um, quite a quite a, a busy three years. So just kind of to give you a little bit of the origin story, in uh, February 2020, we were called to a, a press conference at uh, LA Unified School District with LAPD, and um, 12 year old boy was uh, in junior high school in LA. He was called the China virus coronavirus punched in the head 20 times by another 12-year-old classmate. And we said, you know, this is not okay. Um, 
what are we going to do about it? We actually called uh, friends up in the San Francisco Bay Area and we said, are you seeing sort of this rise in anti-Asian hate? And there was maybe one case of coronavirus in February, 2020, so very early days. And we said, you know, we should call the Department of Justice and see if they're even tracking this. And of course the DOJ was really not doing much at all. So we set up a Google form and literally, literally started tracking the rise in anti-Asian hate incidents uh, and, and violence in our country. And uh, unfortunately, fast forward, um, three years later, we've received over 11,000 self-reports of hate incidents uh, around the country. And we'll talk today about um, what we've done with that information and our, our, our movement uh, moving forward. And, and also we can talk a bit about what's happening in the uh, uh, political scene. Uh, you know, unfortunately we had uh, politicians based in 20, back in 2020 really fomenting uh, uh, whether calling this the Kung flu or China virus that really just affected our community. So that's, you know, three years later, we've learned a lot. We have a, a, a lot of visibility. Uh, Stop API Hate is a coalition of um, API Equity Alliance in Los Angeles, Chinese for Affirmative Action up in San Francisco, and also in partnership with the Asian American Studies Department in San Francisco State. Um, and over the past three years, we've received literally uh, over uh, you know 60,000 donations from individuals and corporations who just said this is uh, this is not okay, and what can I do to help? And and so we are, um, our mission again is to really dismantle and combat systemic racism. And we know that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we also know that's not going to happen just in the AAPI community. So we are a cross-racial solidarity movement, right? So we were working with our African-American, Latino um and different different communities of color to really um, uh, face this. So that's kind of the quick uh, update of where we've been, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, um, thank you. What a what a story about how you started it. It, it. it must be very shocking, and I feel so so bad, so sad for the for the for the kid who have to go through that. But of course, that was only the start, right? And there are many other incidents we've heard that uh, you probably have seen on YouTube. Um, uh, elderly Asian uh, people were punched. Uh, I think a couple cases punched to death. Uh, not so much that it was uh, that they take, take too much of the beat up because number one, they are very senior. And so, and the, the a couple blows that were given to them, they're so violent that they, uh, I think a couple of them actually die in the end. Uh, and you see, if you go on YouTube, you can see many of that, but uh, watch out if you if you don't feel comfortable watching these video, it, it's, um, it's very uh, traumatic. You know, uh, but I wanna jump in, Anna, because this is really good to call out really the difference between what's represented in the media as, as hate crimes versus hate incidents. Um, we actually found that over 80% of our 11,000 reports were actually hate incidents. So incidents of, of verbal harassment, uh, online harassment, harassment, uh, sexual harassment in the streets. Hate crimes actually make up a very small percentage. Uh, our approach is actually very non-carceral. So we'll talk more about a non-carceral approach to uh, fighting this. Um, you know, unfortunately in the media, sometimes you just see sort of that elderly person get pushed or kicked down the street. Um, sometimes you see the perpetrators being uh, African-American and that's been uh, an issue in our, our fight to say actually it's not African-Americans pushing down Asian-Americans, right? It is uh, actually our data shows that it's not that at all, but there is sort of, we have folks on the right sort of fomenting and, and creating sort of the wedge issue. Um, between uh, African American brothers and sisters, and and what, in our movement, so that's something we can talk more about uh, today as well. So I just wanted to really, um, you know, talk about there's a lot of institutional racism that's happening that's come out of this uh, moment that is not just about 
being uh, pushed down the subway. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for reminding us, absolutely. I mean, um, I like that you mentioned that we do have a um, brotherhood actually among all of us is not so much um, race, right, that divide us. And I remember every single incident, I'm sure you do, is that uh, just to name a few, the Allen, Texas shootings, and the Half Moon Bay shooting, and the Monterey Park uh, shooting. It's very sad. Um, I remember personally the most shocking, um, the one that really affect myself and my my circle of friends most is the uh, it was the Monterey Park um, um, incident. Um, my sister in law's very close friend was killed. I don't know that friend uh, personally. But the, the news um, sent a, a wave of fear uh, within the community. Um, I live in Santa Barbara. Uh, and one of the things I miss most is uh, I don't miss that much about Hong Kong. For those of you who don't know, I, I immigrated from Hong Kong when it was a British colony. Something that I miss the most is the food. And I can't make all those food. So therefore, Monterey Park is our safe haven to to, to catch up with our childhood food. So I do go to uh, Monterey Park uh, maybe once or twice a month um, just to enjoy the food and, and, and get the feel of being at home again. So this one, that, that was a very close call. And I can tell you, I've, never, I've not back, gone back. I've not gone back since then. Uh, not that I don't miss the food, the food but it's just too traumatic. And I didn't bring my, typically I go with my mom and I don't want my mom to, to remember that because I don't want her to have that kind of a fear. But do we have the fear? Absolutely, we do have the fear. I remember that when you first started, um, my daughter would call me, where are you going? Um, I don't want you to go by yourself. I mean, um, you never know. No, mom, you, you don't go. I mean, I suddenly, for the first time, I worried about my, my safety. And, uh, and also my freedom, you ripped my freedom. Uh, yeah. Because not only that, I probably won't go, but, but my family won't let me go. Uh, but that was the, the kind of fear that we, we've gone through. So yeah. maybe we can expand uh, more about those uh, few incidents. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the the tragic Monterey Park Lunar New Year shootings uh, in uh, late January of this year, and that came again on the heels of two years of the rise in anti-Asian hate. The Atlanta spa shootings, if most of you remember two years ago, that was really the uh, the flashpoint in the, the Asian American community. It was almost like uh, 40 years after the Vincent Chin murder, this for the younger generation, the Atlanta spa shootings really was a wake up call. And uh, our, our, our younger Asian American activists are saying this is not OK. Obviously, the perpetrator was uh, in that case white. So it was a racially motivated um, a tragedy. Uh, the Monterey Park shooting, the, the Half Moon Bay shooting were actually perpetrated by Asian American gentlemen. And uh, so while they weren't racially motivated, our community was already just so elevated. So I remember, you know, when we got all the texts at one in the morning that that Saturday or Sunday, right after the the dance ballroom shootings, we all our heads went, "Oh, this must be racially motivated, right?" So the community was already um, on edge. And what we learned from the Monterey Park shootings and the Half Moon Bay shootings is. The intersectionality of the work we're doing, unfortunately, um, gun violence, gun violence prevention, um, uh, there is an intersectionality with racism. I mean, if you think about the Second Amendment for your historians here, you all know, actually, the Second Amendment was all about arming white folks so they could keep emancipated slaves in check, right? So let's be real about what the Second Amendment was. I mean, it was based on racist uh, tropes. And what we are uh, learning, we've been meeting with gun violence uh, prevention activists recently, and they said, you know, the Asian American community will be starting to see uh, a rise in violence against our communities. Unfortunately, yes, there's 400 million guns in this community, and you have 
uh, gun manufacturers are actually marketing to Asian Americans. It's disgusting. But after a lot of these shootings, literally, there is marketing materials to Asian Americans, especially in places like Orange County, where you'll have um, Asian Americans that feel that, oh, if I uh, am armed, I will better protect myself. It's just really uh, not a good situation. So we're finding the work we're doing intersects with other issue areas like uh, gun violence, domestic violence. Obviously, domestic violence is, is uh, a huge um, issue in our community. So lots, uh, you know, lots going on. And again, feel free. I know um, Sarah Beth has asked folks to put things in the chat. If you have questions, we'll, we'll be uh, getting to it in a moment. But, uh, you know, Anna, thanks for, uh, you know, bringing up uh, some of these unfortunate incidents. Uh, that have affected our community. Okay, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Norbert. Um, uh, so even though there has been a, a quite a few uh, visible rise in um, anti-Asian hate in America over the past three years, um, is this something new? Yeah, unfortunately, Anna, and and this is sort of a I'm preaching to the choir here, you know. Um, Racism is uh, anti-Asian racism. Racism is as uh, American as apple pie, unfortunately. So when I had, you know, white friends text me in early 2020 saying, oh, Norbert, I'm so sorry this is happening to your community. It's like, you know, know your history. This has been going on. A Chinese Exclusion Act, Japanese incarceration, World War II, uh, persecution of, of Muslim Americans after 9-11, the killing of Vincent Chin, um, the uh, by the Detroit auto workers in in the 80s, 40 years ago. So unfortunately, um, history is repeating itself. It's just more out in the open now. And even we, even now, with uh, sort of the uh, some of the presidential candidates, alien land laws. I mean, just things that you think would not be rising their ugly heads again. Um, it's happening, and we'll talk a bit about. Uh, uh, China scapegoating that's uh, happening in our community. And that's something we are really, uh, we've had conversations with the White House, at least the Biden administration will listen to us and say, okay, when we talk about China policy, let's really be careful about how we, uh, how we talk about policy. You know, Asian Americans, we are not the communist Chinese party. Uh, we think um, a lot of behavior um, in China is, is not good. There's a lot of terrible activities happening, but depending on how you frame that issue, there could be actually a blowback um, on the Asian American community. I mean, even things like look at the, at the TikTok hearings and, and the CEO of TikTok is not even Chinese, he's Singaporean, right? But they didn't sort of beat on uh, Zuckerberg or some of the other uh, white tech folks like they did on this particular TikTok executive. So there was a lot of sort of anti-China scapegoating and uh, resentment. And again, um, the scapegoating, there's history behind it, whether it's the yellow, yellow peril, we were accused of bringing Spanish flu or the women, um, Chinese women were accused of bringing disease to railroad workers, right, in the 1800s. So you know, I, and I know, again, preaching to the choir, there are many of you that know the history, um, but a lot of people now don't know the history. So one of the, there's actually three pillars of what we're focusing on at Stop API Hate. Um, and one is education equity. It's right, folks need to know their history, whether it's ethnic studies or Asian American studies in the schools, whether it's K-12 or in higher education, we know will make more compassionate citizens down the road, better corporate citizens, et cetera. And there's studies out there, right? And you probably all know if you take an ethnic studies class in your first year at Antioch, you're probably gonna be a more compassionate citizen, less racist citizen down the road. So we know that's valuable. Um, the second pillar is civil rights, right? So we're talking about um, how do we make our, our streets, our public transit, our retail spaces, uh, safer. We actually passed legislation. Two bills went through a uh, state of California the past, um, keeping uh, figuring out a way to address racism and 
public transit and also in, in retail spaces. So if Anna and I go to Costco and we're, we're has, harassed and called names, what is Costco's obligation to report that incident? Or if their employers are facing uh, racist harassment, what is Costco's uh, responsibility? So we're moving some of the civil rights policy forward. And then thirdly, uh, community safety. So community safety means not just walking our elderly grandparents across the street in San Francisco Chinatown, but it is mental health, um, um, uh, you know, housing and food security, all of these issues to make um, our communities feel safe. Uh, and I was, uh, someone was telling me about an interview that uh, Lisa Ling, the correspondent did. Uh, she interviewed like some white supremacists in the middle of the country and said, you know, what, what would make you, you know, where is this racism coming from? And a lot of them said, you know, job security, housing, all of that, right? So there's that sort of socioeconomic component that is probably fomenting a level of racism in our country too. So just a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things, you know, going on here that we're, we're trying to, um, we're trying to address. I mean, even today, uh, the candidate, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said some crazy stuff about how the coronavirus was um, doesn't affect Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese, and it was manifest, you know, not case, right? So it's just, it's a whack-a-mole, you know, we're really responding to a lot of the stuff out there, um, but fortunately we have now a level of visibility where, you know, we're saying this is not okay, we're not invisible anymore. I mean, you all just saw the affirmative action ruling by SCOTUS, and that again was trying to create a wedge issue between African American community and Asian American community. Asian Americans, we support affirmative action, right? It's 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 crazy, uh, and you all know sort of the history of the model minority myth that was created by a white UC Berkeley professor to say in the '60s, "Oh, look at these Asians, these Japanese. We lock them up in camp, and they're not complaining. But look at these African Americans; they're rioting in the streets in the '60s." You know, so that's where the model minority myth, which is very harmful, came about. So there's a you know a lot here to unpack, and just again appreciate that this this community is is really open about having these really uh, uh, difficult conversations because they do need to be had. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Norbert, giving us our history and what's been going on. Uh, you, you're so right that um, some of us know about the history, but many, particularly the younger generation, uh, they've never heard about that. So yeah. uh, uh, most people actually thought this is a new thing. This is yeah. new. Um, and also, um, I want to share with you as a as a Hong Kong immigrant, I it kind of like diverse the topic a little bit, but I just want to share uh, with you what we're facing as an immigrant from Hong Kong. Um, myself and my counterparts are sandwiched by the AAPI hate in USA and torment from the Chinese government cracking down on Hong Kong citizens because of the yellow umbrella, umbrella movement. I don't know how many of you have heard about the umbrella movement that is a fight for uh, democracy and freedom from Hong Kong, which uh, used to be a, a British colony. So when I was uh, in Hong Kong, it was a British colony. That's why some students always ask me, uh, Professor Kwong, what is your real name? <laughs> and I say, well, you have, you have your fake name as Anna because that's not the Chinese name. What is your real name? Anna is really my name because um, I was born and raised in a British colony. So English was a formal language and we all have English names. So those names are given by our, our parents. So those are my real names. Um, but now we're sandwiched because with the 1997 um, uh, changeover, um, the, um, the American, the Chinese government actually are pushing um, to take the freedom away from Hong Kong. And that's uh, brought together uh, what they call the umbrella movement, which started in year 2014. Um, so we squeeze on both. Sometimes I thought that in one way, I, th I thought I'm blessed that I have a new home 
Uh, but then with the API hate, I was saying, do I really have a home? Should I call this home? And then the back home is there's a fire there. And yeah, there's no way I can go. I can't go home. There's no home to go. Um, yeah. According to the, the local newspaper, Hong Kong police uh, made about 9,000 arrests, 9,000 arrests between uh, 1919 and year 2020 in connection with the protests. And among those were arrested, uh, 1,700 cases were under 18. Um, 1,500 were secondary students and eight of them were actually primary school students. Um, well, and, and, and another 5,000 is between 18 to 30 years. So we're talk, just talking about one year span. Um, Sometimes it is it is so hard, uh, and up to now is even though you see you you don't see too much about the, our newspaper reporting, but the arrest has not stopped. Right. It still keep going. So that led to Hong Kong having the the biggest exodus uh, in Hong Kong history. Um, they lost about one point six percent of the population. They all left. I had to go to Singapore. Go to um, go to UK, go to Australia, Canada, but USA is not one of the top spots because of the API hate. So, yeah, right. and in fact, I don't even want to tell them, is that this, well, I need to get out of them. Uh, very often I may not suggest that would you consider USA? Because I don't know what to say. I mean, when they mention them, well, maybe USA is not our choice because USA don't like us. <laughs> So that that's my experience. You have any any? No, that's it's interesting perspective. Uh, again, Stop API Hate is is tracking reports, mostly from Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the United States, but we've re received reports from Canada, Australia, around the world, um, sort of anti Asian sentiment and and whether it's a workplace discrimination or out in the public places. Um, you know, when we were talking earlier about Anna, the the, the law enforcement response in in Hong Kong and and by the Chinese government, where it's very political uh, versus here, which is you know, unfortunately, we have sort of a a paramilitary law enforcement organization that's imbued with white supremacy and gangster. It's it's a little crazy. So you know, we are really looking at non carceral approaches in terms of fighting institutional racism, systemic racism. I mean, talking about history, I, I always tell my friends that, you know, I'm, I'm 54 years old. I probably learned about um, the Black Wall Street Tulsa massacres like a few years ago, which is embarrassing that we didn't learn it in school, right? And there's just tons of pieces of our history where, um, you know, we are we are certainly in support of um, critical race theory and really teaching what really happened and not sweeping it under the rug. Um, it, it's just, uh, uh, I had a colleague who just uh, traveled to Berlin, Germany and talked about at least how the Germans really recognized the atrocities that they did and they're trying to own up to it. Um, unlike in this country where we tend to sort of sweep it under the rug or, or try to deny uh, all of the injustices uh, against our, our, our marginalized communities for centuries. So, um, you know, I, I, I see a, actually a question in by David in terms of, can we talk about some of the wins uh, that we've had in our movement the past few years and how we can get folks to actually participate? You know, uh, David, as I mentioned, we had some recent legislative wins. So finally, um, at least in California, the legislators really taken um, action on, on creating um, safer spaces in public transit and retail spaces, uh, addressing uh, discrimination. We also received a, a unprecedented $160 million API equity budget that the governor signed a couple of years ago. He added just another $40 million to that uh, this year to support um, um, anti-hate work in our in California. Not not just anti-Asian hate work, but working 
in cross-racial solidarity with other organizations. Again, 160, 200 million is a drop in the California state budget, but it is, you know, one of the firsts. So we are, and again, we're working uh, across the country uh, just to be more, more visible. That's been one of the issues in the Asian American community about being that sort of silent minority. So we have a lot of younger activists that are saying, hey, we're going to be um, loud and, and proud and, and speak up and, and say, you know, we, we belong in this country like citizens, not just because we win a gold medal in figure skating or a Nobel Prize or start a tech company. And, and that's the problem. Sometimes people sort of just celebrate Asian Americans when they achieve these things. But, you know, we are just part of the fabric of of this country, and we really want uh, to underscore that. Uh, you know, and David, I think some of the wins on the media side, you're seeing more representation in media um, differently than when we were younger. You know, when I was a kid, it was Mr. Miyagi and Happy Days in the Calgon commercial, right? I think those were the only two Asian Americans we saw in media, but now uh, we see representation beyond the usual stereotype of martial arts or, geisha or a, a doctor or a lawyer, we'll see things like on Netflix, uh, Beef was a great series because it showed our, you know, our flaws as, as a community. It's actually a great kind of crazy series, but it was definitely not the mono minority myth series. And I think there was a recent, it's a movie, is it called Joy, Joy Ride or something like that, which is definitely not the Joy Luck Club, right? So it's about four younger Asian American females, I think, on a road trip, and it's fairly R-rated, right? So it's about, um, you know, I think there are wins there. My 15 and a half year old daughter gets to see people who look like her on YouTube, TikTok, et, et cetera, where, you know, we didn't have that ex experience. And um, yeah, so... Let me see. I am happy to just field some questions. I don't know, Sarah, if there's anything I can see the chat now. Um, is it Isa? Isa had a question about, yeah, oh, great. So the inclusion of PI and API, so great. Um, so the Pacific Islander experience is very different than the South Asian immigrant experience or the Chinese American immigrant experience. Um, we stole land from Pacific Islanders, whether it's from Hawaii, just flat out stealing land and oppressing communities. So historically, uh, the community is very different, but we kind of got um, from a demography standpoint, sort of put together. We, we, you know, we so we work in closely with the Pacific Islander community and had these different conversations literally from saying Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, and the and is really important, including the native Hawaiian communities, um, but recognizing that it's very different. So for example, um, COVID, let's say, uh, we received a lot of funding to do outreach in the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities with COVID and, and vaccine outreach very different outcomes. The Korean American community, highly vaccinated, low COVID rates, some in the Pacific Islander community, because culturally you have multi-generational families, there's um, a religious component where there's some skepticism about vaccination. There's a lot of uh, military history within some of our Pacific Islander community in, in Los Angeles. So it was actually hard to get in there with some of the vaccine outreach. So we had to do things differently. So it was not all the same in the AAPI community. Same with, um, you know, the anti-Asian hate. I was at a conference where um, a gentleman, he stood up, he was Samoan and he's like, you know, I hear you guys, but no one is, <laughs> you know, one's been tagging me because he's a big Samoan guy, right? So he's not facing at that point in time, the same type of anti-Asian hate. So we absolutely recognize it's a different um, uh, community, different immigrant experience. Uh, we are, yeah, it's it's absolutely, um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, yeah, it's something we're working on all the time, even within our organization and coalition to have more Pacific Islander 
representation. Oh, and that's why the affirmative action thing was crazy because it's actually adversely affecting Pacific Islanders, right? So, you know, the whatever the, the handful of Chinese Americans who didn't get into Harvard, they could go anywhere, they're fine, right? So, but this is actually uh, the recent ruling will be adversely affecting uh, low income uh, Pacific Islander uh, communities. So, um, yeah, yeah. And then Jean Karamura, yeah, Jean again, it's a bit total wedge issue again. Um, uh, um, and we are really getting out there and, and you're all doing, you know, the hard work, really educating young folks about the nuances in, in um, racial dynamics. Uh, yeah, it's, we need to do a lot more. I mean, that's why, again, ethnic studies is, is so, uh, so, so important. Uh, you know, we have to really address issues um, in our community too. Like we face a level of anti-Blackness in our community and we're calling that out. We're saying that's not okay. You know, we're 30 years away from uh, Saigu, right? The, the LA uprising, many of you were obviously here and involved with the racial healing, uh, and we've made a lot of strides uh, in the Asian American and African American communities and trying to to work together. So it's uh, you know something we is part of our DNA as uh, as a movement, and um, you know we're, we're continuing to do that work. And I see Dr. Lipinski is here. Good to see you. And um, yeah. Um, let me see. And I, I know this is not a shy group, so I'm sorry if I'm missing. And feel free to raise your hand or go off mute if someone wants to, to chime in here. Um, Fox has posted a question, Norbert. Um, Fox, do you want to share your question? Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everything you're sharing. This is such a vital conversation. Um, and I also wanted to thank you for your service to the AAPI Equity Alliance and all of your incredibly powerful activist work. It's just, you're you're such a powerful speaker and it's wonderful to hear you share. And, and that goes for you too, Anna, of course. Um, and just posing to um, both you or both of you, um, how does it feel for you to share all of this with us? I know that's a very personal question. Yeah. So don't no, know. I'll be honest. It's it's liberating, uh, you know, just because we I, I know a bunch of folks on this call. Uh, my past three years with API Equity Alliance, this was actually my first professional career in non-white space. I've been working in white spaces my entire career, right? So I've had to check myself, and and a lot of the, the senior folks know on it. If I'm talking to donors or board members that are mostly old white folks and I'm raised as an Asian American to respect your elders, at what point in my career did I really have to say, hey, you know, I'm an executive director and at a nonprofit and working with a board of directors, really, how do I show up in those conversations? And that's, it's taxing. I think what we have found in, oh, I forgot to uh, link that article. Many of you have heard this article about the um, the physiological trauma of of race. Uh, they did a study right with African American women and just the cumulative effect of racism over African American women's lives. I mean, there's like a life expectancy thing. And this uh, uh, this researcher also looked at uh, Latinas who like upper class Latinas had a shorter lifespan and more stress because of racial trauma because. They were trying to code switch and 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 do all of that versus a Latina in predominantly Latino community in LA. It's just phenomenal. So yes, there's sort of this traumatic uh, cumulative effect of, of being the other in your entire career. So that's one thing I, I don't uh, have this time around. It's really, so that's interesting. So that's sort of a personal point I would... Uh, you know, happy, happy to share, um, you know, and I think David's earlier question about what our participants can do to help. It's just like, you know, coming to these conversations, having the hard conversations, um, advocating for your community, volunteering at other um, 
social racial justice organizations in your community um, uh, is really important is just having the conversation uh, and continuing this conversation. Um, uh, Anna, go ahead, Anna. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing all those. And, and Fox, that's a great, uh, great uh, comment about it. I want to share this feeling that I've been, I never have a chance to share with my Antioch uh, colleagues is that um, Antioch is really a very special place. Um, ever since I started working here is that I learned more about anti-racism. And obviously, needless to say that I don't, I have never felt and we as welcomed as I am in at Antioch. And there's no one person in this institution that made me feel that I'm different. I am limited, I am, I'm Asian. I mean, I, I still feel that from the outside world, uh, but not within Antioch. So therefore I, I really must thank every one of you to give me a safe space and make me feel who I can act act your act who I am. I feel comfortable with everyone. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I echo that, uh, Anna, because for some of you that know, when I joined in, in uh, 2017, it was right after, you know, the, the trauma of the Trump election and Antioch was the first place. What a sanctuary, right? We could come in and be in fellowship with each other and cry and be angry about this injustice where I came from a workplace. It was community college environment but i had you know i had sort of trumpers on my staff and that was really hard as a leader to say okay there are people under my employee that but it's for someone that basically doesn't want my type of person to be here it's you know that was hard and you know what a sanctuary antioch was uh certainly at the time and we could have those honest conversations and 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 all and you continue to do that uh, today, so applaud you all. Uh, Clarence, uh, you have a question? Your hand is up? Or Clarence, are you going to well, correct me well, on something, which I welcome as well? <laughs> well, no, I'm not going to do that this time, Norbert. But historically speaking, I love the fact that you said, you know, historically, I mean, I'm sorry, you said um, the relational DNA and um, what comes to my mind immediately is African American. Um, population, especially post-slavery, the relationship that African Americans had in the South since the, um, you know, the planters went and got, you know, Chinese people to come into the South to do that work. Um, but my, my real point that I really want to bring up is there's so many scenarios like that from that relational DNA you speak of, the Japanese, and the African Americans in LA, for instance, how they protected their property when they were in the concentration yeah, camps. Yeah. People don't talk about that. Right. So these are factoids that education is so important. And we know in certain states, in certain schools, in certain situations, they're not gonna get that information. So my question becomes, with this multi-million dollar pot of money that our governor has thrown out there for some this work to be done, what kind of campaigns are you all putting together to try to educate people, you know, on so many levels? I mean, especially with our young people, they don't have a clue as to what these facts are. They don't know the great relationships yeah. that Chinese yeah. Americans had with Black Americans. Yeah. They don't know the great relationships that, that um, Japanese people had with African Americans. Right. And then you look at the land grab situation, you know, with the, the Hawaiians, you know, and, and others. And if they had that information, maybe they would think twice before they would hurl that brick or kick someone because in their eyes, everyone is Chinese. Everybody's Chinese, it doesn't matter where you're from, they're all Chinese. And so that piece of ignorance needs to be corrected too. So what are you guys doing in terms of campaigns, in terms of sensitizing yeah. communities around these really crucial facts? So yeah. these relationships can, can once again provide a bridge and not a divide. Yeah, no, it's all about know your history, whether it's Grace Lee Boggs on, on and on and on. But, you know, Clarence, you're so right. And, and we're actually careful about, yes, we believe Asian American history is important, but we really think in the context of ethnic studies, it's, it's really important. As Clarence mentioned, there's so much 
intersectionality between our cultures. So we need to be um, uh, not sort of siloed in our thinking. You know, and we're working, whether it's with Asian American studies departments, ethnic studies departments around the country, we're, we're leaning on people who've been doing this for a while, but if we have the visibility to stop API hate, we could sort of get it in front of electeds where maybe in the past um, we can't. There, there are some organizations that are promoting, oh, you know, maybe one credit in high school or college, something really minimal. We really believe there's a, a, a bigger a bigger road or, or a bigger path to carve out in terms of integrating uh, sort of in a cross-curricular platform um, of this this experience of of uh, the different communities of color and marginalized communities over our history. So it's, you know, it's a long, long, long road. And I know, know you're all doing that in, in your work at Antioch and integrating these hard conversations. So at least this next generation won't uh, grow up so ignorant like our generation. I mean, the fact that there's so much in our history that we were not taught uh, or even know about. So uh, appreciate that comment, uh, Clarence. And then, you know, I saw Wilder puts in, yeah, there's just been some great uh, media representations. Uh, you know, I just finally saw that uh, Korean American movie, Minari, which was a wonderful piece about uh, Korean American immigrant experience uh, from California to Arkansas. And just those are films that we just didn't see before, right? So it's great that there's some of those things um, out there. Um, Ian, did you have your hand up? Hey, Ian. Hello, thank you. I just wanted to add to what Clarence said. Um, and just from a Latinx perspective, I'm um, uh, Latinx, but I'm also Chinese American. And um, and so during the AAPI, I, my wife's Korean, I kind of got some of that personally, people yelling, as Clarence said, and she was Chinese that day. And that that hurt, but I also felt my Chinese side. But I just want to say, yeah, there's also wonderful connections that I discovered with the Latinx community, yeah. historical, I kind of, yeah. uh, that's great too for people like right. to know about um, any of me also being aware of who I was. Absolutely, you know, Ian, you know, in the, in the border, right? In Calexico, there's a large Chinese American community, fluent in Spanish, our, our daughters, fluent in Spanish, we enrolled her in a dual immersion program when we were up in Oxnard, you know, and, and there's so much history with the Latino community supporting the Japanese American community when we were, my wife is fourth generation Japanese American. And when her grandparents were incarcerated, they owned farmland and their Latino neighbors protected their farmland when they came back, right? Unlike the banks, right? When they went back to the banks, Bank of America, they're like, oh, we don't have your money anymore. I mean, just, you know, horrific stuff. But thank you, Ian, for your comment. Um, yeah, and Kat puts in, you know, seeing Red, the animated uh, 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 show uh, movie was great because it really, yeah, for younger people just to to see that uh, the Asian American experience is more than just that model minority myth. So, you know, I appreciate that comment. Um, Kat, yeah. Um. No, but I, I want to mention one thing is that uh, a, a very good trend these days is that I see more and more Asian are speaking up. Um, they laugh at our own culture and it's, it's a lot more open. I think you and I know that we are, uh, some, some people comment Asian are the invisible, invisible uh, race because uh, based on the Confucianism and all our culture that we were taught to actually be very obedient, be very uh, adaptive, um, just follow what the government say and we want to be invisible by nature. We were taught like that, particularly the immigrant. Uh, and we, I, I have to say that I must confess in some way that we pass them to the, the first generation as well. Yeah, but yeah. I'm beginning to see that um, suddenly the Asians are beginning to speak up uh, because they were told that it's okay to speak up. And that's, that's a great news. Uh, uh, it's true that in the very beginning of the pandemic time is that um, Asian got beat up and they, 
they didn't report it. Um, they were. Oh, yeah. well, so we know this is totally underreported. So we've done some corollary studies with other research groups. So our 11,000, those are just self reports. There's 24 million Asian Americans in this country. We did a survey with Edelman, uh, uh, Edelman PR, and they found that, um, you know, one in five Asian Americans experienced discrimination and hate over the, the two year period uh, post pandemic. Oh, so we know it's totally underreported, Anna, but you really, uh, you know, bring up um, some great points. And I think the younger generation, yeah, they're not putting up with it at all anymore, for sure. Um, so what would your organization advise uh, on or Asian or African American, whoever, that actually face uh, potential violence of someone that they don't know randomly in the street, what should they do? Is there any advice on how they should protect themselves? Well, you know, there's there's bystander training that's out there that not necessarily supportive. Of, you, you know, obviously there's uh, trying to really de-escalate a situation and get away from a situation uh, and, and report it. Um, but I think the more folks that are aware and can be supportive of each other uh, in our community, the better. You know, I don't want to be Pollyanna about it, but just even having this conversation, just educating folks. I mean, a lot of my white friends had no idea. It's just like all the, the guys on this call, right? With the Me Too movement six, seven, eight years ago, I'll have to be honest with you. I think all of us guys, we were super surprised that all of our female family members, friends, they all had a, an unfortunate Me Too experience. And we were, we had no idea. And maybe because some of us were like the nice guys and didn't we weren't jerks in the workplace, but we had no idea. So I think it's just like um, white Americans right now maybe have no idea that this was happening sort of historically and, and ongoing. So it's about continuing to just um, get to know our community, read up, uh, just understanding different nuances and, and know that we're also not a, a monolith community. So... So it actually getting everyone to start speaking up and sharing. And I always believe that no matter what race we are, we have the, we share the sisterhood and the brotherhood. The best is to work together in unison. Uh, we just want a peaceful world and uh, to do what we want to do. Um, as an immigrant, I really appreciate the freedom was given to us from the government. Sometimes people say that we're too free. Uh, but in any case, uh, if we're given a choice, it would be nice if younger generation learn to more collaborate rather than being suspicious about other race. If we can all be colorblind, that that will be wonderful. Uh, yeah, you know, and just sort of a slight uh, uh, slight amendment to that. I think uh, colorblind is also a loaded a loaded word. I, you know, we're really talking about appreciation, uh, different backgrounds, everyone's different backgrounds, sort of a multicultural way to, you know, I'm really encouraged with, frankly, what, uh, you know, we've seen in, in, in the LGBTQ movement where uh, there are conversations we're having now that we didn't even have a year ago, two years ago. I know it seems like three steps forward, two steps back with some of the crazy legislation, but I think the, the visibility uh, that we've, uh, that that movement has had is, is great. And I, we're learning a lot from that. Same with anti-gun violence movement. We work with them just to see what that is looking like. And same with, you know, movement for black lives. We work with them to say, okay, what, what has happened since the murder of George Floyd? There was a lot of attention in the community, a lot of money, you know, Black Lives Matter raised a hundred million dollars in a year. Are they going to raise that every year afterwards? Probably not. And the same thing with um, our movement, Stop API Hate, raised a bunch of money after the Atlanta shootings. But we've seen corporations, uh, they did their guilt money two years ago. They put up their statements on their website. So when we are talking to companies now, it's calling them out to say, this is not sort of a one and done situation. You need to really uh, invest in our communities and our diverse communities. Uh, one of the um, uh, common belief uh, within the group of a messy conversation with my partners, uh, our team members actually remember when we first started the 
messy conversation we were we were talking about is that um, it tends to be more trendy and then it went out of fashion. But one of the things we pledge with each other is that no matter what, we want to stick with this messy conversation and we want this anti-racism sentiments to keep going on and 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 trying to make a more positive change uh, within yeah. our community. Sometimes we uh, invite uh, outside community leaders to share with us. Education is so important. It's so uh, important. Yeah, so I mean, so important, you know, and this note on we were working with um, Anti-Defamation League because anti-Semitism is continues to rise its ugly head, right? So we are also in solidarity with the Jewish American community. Um, uh, they actually advised on the formation of a new foundation called the Asian American Foundation, TAF. And TAF uh, is made up of a, a bunch of sort of wealthy Asian American tech folks. They're trying to do the right thing. Uh, but one of the things they've done is they created um, a survey called the Status Index. Uh, and I think they have their third year report out now. And they interviewed uh, Americans across uh, the country and asked, you know, please name a prominent Asian American. And it was like 7% named uh, Jackie Chan, 6% named Bruce Lee, 1% like Lisa Ling, right? So they didn't even know we have a vice president who's Asian American in the White House and Jackie Chan's not American and Bruce Lee's dead, right? So that just shows you, woof, we have um, still a long ways to go, but you know, we're, we're continuing uh, to have the conversation and the movement. Okay, this is one. I see that we're almost here at five o'clock, which is the time that we let some folks go who need to head out and the rest of us stay on for a little bit deeper conversation if you can. If sure. there are announcements, uh, I'll ask for those. Yeah, um, and, and Kat just put something in the chat about um, Antioch's mm -hmm. new mission, which is great to hear. Um, uh, and I don't know, Kat, is, is this question for me or sort of to the group in general? Uh, I think it's to both you and the group. As um, a member of the AAPI Equity Alliance, one of the things that we're trying to do with the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Center is connect with community organizations and helps tell the stories of our regions. Um, one of the things that complicates Antioch's belonging to the TRHT Center group through the American Association of Colleges and Universities is that we have four physical locations, all with very different um, kind of regional makeups of who's in our communities that we need to pay attention to and to serve. And that's one of our kind of challenges, not quite a barrier, is making sure that we are um, elevating the voices of, of lots of people who have faced oppression and abuse in the community and making sure that we're reconciling those stories within our institution. So I was wondering how the TRHT might also incorporate references and um, relationships to local groups like the AAPI Equity Alliance that has kind of a, a foothold in Los Angeles as we're starting to build this center and to tell these stories. Uh, uh, yeah, Kat, I mean, I think just on my part, you you know, you all have my contact information. There are a lot of resources on our stopapihate.org website. And, and certainly with the Seattle, Los Angeles campuses, of course, it's it's there is um, maybe a larger API community than those areas. But I, I think it's a chance to uh, really work with the other campuses because you're all Antioch. So yeah, it's a, maybe there's some folks in Keene uh, that just don't have many Asian Americans, but it's a chance to do that type of outreach or in, in Yellow Springs, et cetera. So um, I think that's the opportunity you have that you're at least connected as an academic institution and you can uh, put this out there. So um, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants it. I mean, that's great you're doing it though. I mean, it's 
it's it's conversation that just needs to be had and even as progressive as Antioch has been I think you've been sort of the lone voice in academic institutions about having these really difficult conversations right all these elite institutions are often saying oh we're finally realized that we were built on on slave money and okay we're going to set up a little scholarship fund we're like okay you know but whether it's Hastings Law School or just crazy, crazy stuff, but we're starting to see sort of, sort of cracks in those uh, in the armor, and and hopefully we'll we'll get there soon. Okay. As we move into our informal session, anybody else have any other comments or questions? Only for Norbert. I'm curious, Norbert, uh, like how do people engage with your organization? How do they find you and what what kinds of support do you provide? And uh, Yeah, yeah. Again, on on both the API Equity Alliance website or the stopaapihate.org website, uh, you know, we have all the information. Actually, we just uh, refreshed our Stop API Hate website um, because it was very elementary at the, at the beginning of, of uh, the movement. So we have resources there, ways to contact us. Uh, so we, we do a ton of speaking engagements, whether it's myself, other senior folks, our founders. Um, so we're talking to a lot of uh, employee resource groups at corporations, educational institutions like yours, um, and just uh, getting the word out there. Uh, but, but we, you know, we recognize we uh, it's it's different than three years ago, uh, uh, but we we believe this is this is really a long term movement, and we're in it for the, the long haul. So that's what we are are telling folks. I mean, like I, you know, love the conversations about reparations that are finally bubbling to the top. I know many of you know that that's been going on for decades, but sort of it's showing up more in the mainstream media and and those are conversations that need to be had and um you know we we support that for sure i've been um spending a lot of time reading about the affirmative action decision and um different groups responses and i appreciate your comments on that earlier i feel like it's uh it's an issue that is yeah well going to take us well beyond the election coming up to to grapple with how this affects uh different states and different yeah. people and but you know I, i'm hopeful sarah that hopefully other states will do at least california like the uc system really figured out a way to compensate for that you know maybe if if there could be some of that um uh, that may help because I know my experience at UC Berkeley was positively affected because I had a more diverse community when I went to UC Berkeley when it was $600 a semester when mm -hmm. you know I had more peers of color maybe than uh, exist right now in some of those institutions so um, for sure I, I got a lot out of it and we know others uh, benefit from that type of diversity um, you know, both racially, ethnically, uh, socioeconomically, et cetera. So. But, you know, happy to come back again, Anna. It's always wonderful to, to see everyone. I know it's just been a crazy uh, few years and the pandemic. And uh, is the Santa Barbara campus open, open now, Ryan? You actually have people there or is it still... That's a trick question, Norbert. Um, <laughs> the Santa Barbara campus that you knew is being is in is being repaired. Uh, oh. We are at SPCC right now. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's better for your recruiting, right? They're right there. So. Well, you can't beat the location. Uh, yeah. Oceanfront property uh, in Santa Barbara. So, yeah, it's gorgeous. We just we just landed here a couple of weeks ago, so we're adapting. But it's all been really nice so far. Oh my God! Yeah. And you will be going back to the other location. Uh, that as of now, yeah, where it's a little. We, that's the plan for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 
So it's, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, interesting times. I mean, this whole virtual and in-person world with the younger generation and, and how sort of racism can permeate the online racism piece, the online bullying piece is a, is a big deal. I mean, there are things that are people are saying online that they wouldn't say face-to-face, -face, unfortunately. So, you know, those are things that we are also fighting, so. And does your organization um, respond to some of the bullying that happens in schools for little kids? Yeah, I mean, we we work with there's some organizations like um, Act to Change that work specifically on online bullying or bullying in schools. So we uh, certainly partner and provide resources to them. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's again a moving target. Goodness, right? With with Twitter or people migrating to Threads. I mean, we'll see what happens on all of these uh, platforms. We actually have conversations with companies, whether it's Tinder or nextdoor.com or video gaming uh, companies. They're talking to us saying, yeah, we know our platforms aren't perfect. You know, people are saying hateful things on the gaming platform or on Tinder or on nextdoor.com that are racist. So what can we do? How can you help us? So yeah, we're talking to um, corporations who wanna do the right thing. We had a conversation with Yelp the other day because there was, actually some of you know in Fresno, there was a, a Thai restaurant that had to close because it happened to be next door to um, a resident that had left a dog outside and this woman basically posted a video of, oh, look, uh, this dog doesn't have any food. Look next to, it. it's a Thai restaurant. They probably serve dog. And just the level of online trolling and basically the restaurant closed down and we talked to the family and unfortunately they're going to try to move the restaurant but we had a conversation with Yelp that said you know your 24-hour response and takedown of hateful comments is actually not fast enough you need to have sort of another way so they you know they heard us and we're having those types of same with Uber you know we're having conversations with platforms like Uber and Airbnb just to really because unfortunately racism is systemic and we know beyond the workplace, a lot of these new platforms, um, different ways of, of racist behavior sh uh, are showing up, so. Wow, this is impressive. I am so glad to hear all the work your organization is doing. That's, that's wonderful. Well, you know, we appreciate your support and we appreciate you wanting to have the conversation with your community. And that's uh, really the most important thing. Well, thanks to the organizer. I think David has a point. Oh, okay, yeah. David. I, I wanna pick your brain for a second, Norbert, okay. around uh, the issue of coalition politics, which you know, I'm a big yeah. believer in the value yeah. of coalition politics. And you know, you, you're, you're in the midst of that yeah. uh, in your work around AAPI. We're all familiar with the, well, there's cultural differences within that community and so on and so forth. But I wonder if you could say maybe two things, because a lot of us are working in different coalitions, yeah. right? And uh, and so we have some common issues and, and maybe some wisdom to share with one another. So so one is, from your perspective, what's the, what's the value of coalition politics especially in AAPI. Yeah. And, and, and then, you know, what, what, beyond the obvious cultural differences, what's the real challenge that you wrestle with in that community? Yeah, so that's a whole nother messy conversation, but sort of in the short few minutes, you know, yeah. coalition building is so hard, right? Because the accountability, so Stop API Hate is a coalition of three organizations that report to our different boards and have different staff, even though we, the advantage is we have 150 years of, of work that we can bring to the table, right? So we're not a three-year-old startup, but we are bringing this experience to the table. That's the advantage. Um, yeah, the messy part is just folks not necessarily reporting to each other and, and the different power struggles. So I will bring a, a new conversation. We are part of the Our LA initiative. I think some of you know in Los Angeles, our city council 
membership is totally misrepresented, right? We have a handful of city council members for a whole lot of people in the city of LA versus in New York City, for example, they have 52 city council members. So we are talking about city council expansion. And we know because of those those uh, really racist calls by the council members and all of that that came public, that really inspired our LA to kind of form. And we are working in cross-racial solidarity with other groups, but it's going to be a hard conversation, right? So in the African-American community, technically there are city council seats where the African-American community has a good amount of power and representation. But if you expand 15 council members to 24, 30, how is that gonna affect the African-American community? It may give more representation to the Asian-American community, but so those are just, really hard conversations we want to have now because we're trying to do this together because I think in general we want better representation across the city of LA uh, for example but that's uh, you know that's the hard hard work we're we're doing and and again that's why with stop API hate particularly taking a non-carceral approach to our work because we know it's not about locking up more black and brown brothers and sisters, right? We know that's not the way to go. So we don't wanna be a part of that. So oftentimes we say no a lot to law enforcement. We get calls from, you know, all sorts of law enforcement agency. Oh, we wanna set up this hotline. We wanna, you know, lock more people up. And we're like, no, that's not, that's not the uh, approach we're taking. So, you know, th there you are, uh, but it's, yeah, the coalition work is, super hard because you don't have that level of hierarchy um you have to just hopefully have a common goal and and know that we can uh, lift each other up and and not sort of cannibalize each other's work yeah thank thank you for that and of course in addition the demographics are continually shifting and i remember back in the 90s uh, here in Los Angeles, that a lot of African American leaders were saying uh, fairly publicly, this was sort of the last opportunity to make significant change in that would benefit the African American community because the demographics are shifting in right. such a way that their voices are going to be overwhelmed by uh, Latino uh, community, and yeah, so it just it, it it's really <laughs> as you well know very com com complicated it is messy yeah and, uh, I, I wanted may i ask, ask at something Norbert and david uh just it was exciting to hear this part of the conversation about uh coalition politics uh, uh in the in the when you're dealing with institutions intra-institutions or trans institutions inter-institutional stuff so the the activism that can take place really gotta be uh, in the lines of uh, identifying stakeholders that normally are not the ones that are in power. They are the no normally the ones that are that are like uh, oriented towards collaboration rather than competition. Uh, and then that work is is, is very like a fine needle work. <laughs> and and then uh, it, that's that's something I wanted to bring up that that you probably have noticed already. <laughs> and uh, and and also the issue of the the the. Yeah, the, the 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 kind of a like a combination of agendas that that, that needed to be that we place once those stakeholders are identified. It's not like just a shortcut to confrontation, and to just call it out and that kind of stuff when institutions are involved, because otherwise it just just bounces back and then just gets um, really I wouldn't say messy but messed up. <laughs> so I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I mean, there are issues like whether it's immigration or formerly incarcerated folks that, you know, that I was talking to a, a API Rise. They're a group that helps formerly incarcerated Asian Americans sort of re enter society. And they were like, there was discrimination inside the jail because they were actually such a, a small minority. They, you know, really didn't have a say in what was going on. And it was just very challenging. And, and same in, the immigration conversation, it's mostly um, a Latino conversation, but immigration is discrimination in a lot of ways that affects Latinos and, and, and Asian Americans is the same right with the deportation and all of that, that stuff that it actually um, hurts our community uh, equally and we need to be part of that, 
uh, conversation. So hear what you're saying. So, well, well, thank you again, Anna, for, for inviting me and having me. And thank you, David, and everyone for, for hosting. Well, um, no, but when I invite you, it seems like it's because of convenience, but actually you're the perfect speaker on this topic. Your knowledge is extensive. Mm -hmm. And of course, your, your heart is in there. I know that it's not, it's not your work. It's, it's, this is something you really care about. <laughs> and when I hear you talk about it, I can yeah. see the excitement. And, the and Anna knows the, the price is right. I'm happy to do this for my friends at Antioch Pro Bono. We charge corporations big speaking fees now, Anna. So, <laughs> yeah. But just happy to uh, be part of this uh, conversation. So thank you again. So that's why Edelman was hired. I got it now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Good to see everyone. And we'll uh, do this again. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, Norbert. Good I'll to see you too, Norbert. Thank you. Thank you, Norbert. We we'll have lunch or something, okay? Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, Ryan, for